I'm now going to address the issue of government influence on trade. We'll be looking at promotion and primarily protectionism. As we've seen in the previous example with comparative advantage, there are obvious benefits to trade. We saw gains from trade. Granted, it was a simplified example, but we demonstrated clearly gains from trade to both countries, even when absolute advantage did not exist because of this notion of comparative advantage. Despite these gains from trade, however, many barriers to trade continue to exist. We're going to look at these barriers in two categories. The first is natural barriers, and the second category is man-made barriers. Let me explain a little bit more what I mean by each. First, natural barriers to trade. So these are things that exist. Nobody intends for them to be barriers to trade, but they do serve as barriers to trade. So uh, one of the most obvious is geography. Um, just distance between places can serve as a barrier to trade. If we go back to the example on comparative advantage, it was a simplified example, so there were some things that were assumed out. Well, now I want to kind of make it a little bit more complex and introduce some things back in. Remember I said that um, you know, there would be trade of smartphones from Argentina to Brazil in exchange for laptops. Well, actually it was the other way around, I'm sorry. Argentina was going to be producing the laptops and taking them to Brazil to exchange for smartphones. Uh, we didn't include the costs associated with the transportation of the laptops to Brazil and the smartphones back to Argentina. If we did that, there will be some additional costs that will reduce the gains from trade. Those clearly are there. Uh, the costs of cost of, uh, of gas and the, and the capital cost of the truck and whatever that might be used to transport those goods back and forth. Um, that's a, a function of geography. Those kinds of barriers are going to exist. There are also differences in language and culture that can serve as barriers to trade. Again, going back to our comparative example, comparative advantage example. Oops, everything went crazy on me. Hold on. Going back to our comparative ad advantage example, um, let's say that the uh, computers being produced in Argentina are all uh, shipped with a, an instruction manual that is in Spanish. In addition to that, all of the programs and software and operating system that are, that's loaded on the laptop is in Spanish as well. Well, that poses a problem for those customers in Brazil because in Brazil they speak Portuguese. So another cost that we'll have to incur is a translation of all the materials and software and operating system from Spanish to Portuguese to make it usable in Brazil. Now that's a one-time cost per product, but it could add up across a number of different products, and that's going to reduce the gains from trade as well. Of course, we have the same problem in the other direction with the smartphones going from Brazil to Argentina being translated into Spanish. All right, other natural barriers to trade. Well, we have all these other differences in political, legal, and economic systems. You might argue, hey, wait, those are all man-made constructions. True, but the reason I'm putting them in the category of natural barriers to trade is that nobody goes out to uh, formulate their entire political or legal system or economic system on the basis of what's this going to do to trade. Uh, trade is going to be in the mix there somewhat, and there are going to be laws on trade and, and things, but if you have differences, strong differences in economic systems, you have a centrally planned economy versus a, a free market capitalist economy, or you have another country that's following state-based capitalism, uh, those could pose some barriers to trade, make it harder to trade, um, even though the decision to use that particular economic system was not based on its impact on trade necessarily. All right, currencies, another possible problem in the previous example. We simplified that out, but what if there are fluctuations in the value of the Brazilian real versus the Argentinian peso? Uh, those actually have occurred. The real has strengthened dramatically. The peso has weakened dramatically. So um, that could pre create problems for trade and disrupt those comparative advantages that we saw would exist. All right, moving on to the man-made barriers to trade. <clears throat> These are things that are specifically designed to reduce the gains from trade. That's the starkest way to say it. Uh, now, 
Why would a country want to reduce the gains from trade? Well, we'll explore that in more detail in a minute. But what are these things that serve as barriers to trade? First, we have tariffs. This is probably the most common form of barrier of a barrier to trade is a tariff. And I have a list here of various tariffs. The export tariff is rarely used. That is a, a tax. A tariff is just a tax on the movement of goods across a national border. And in, in the case of an export tariff, you are moving goods out of the country, exporting them to another country, and the home country government is charging a tax or a tariff on those goods that are being exported. If you recall back to our mercantilist discussion, there continues to exist a bias in almost all country governments in favor of exports and against imports. Well, any government that wants to increase exports is not going to put a tariff on products being exported, so it's very rarely used. Uh, it might be used actually where it's most usually used and has been most recently used is in the agricultural field, um, particularly a product such as rice. So a few years ago there was a big uh, problem of a shortage, global shortage of rice. There was a, a poor crop and some natural disasters that contributed to a number of problems in some rice producing nations. And uh, many countries for which rice is a staple food were very concerned that they would not have enough supply and that the cost of that rice would skyrocket. Well, uh, the rice producers <clears throat> um, want to sell to the highest uh, bidder, the, uh, I mean the customer that will pay the highest price, but the countries didn't want the rice to leave the country through exports. So they put an export tariff on to preserve the supply and make it so that there's no incentive for rice producers to sell to anyone outside of the country because the tax would be so high that there would not be a cost advantage. All right, so that's one way that export tariffs might be used, but they are rarely used. Transit tariffs are also rarely used. They are merely a tax on goods traveling through your country. And in this day and age, very rarely do we see goods just traveling through. Uh, it's a lot more point-to-point -point logistics. All right, an import tariff. This is the most common form of tariff. This is a tax on products imported into your country. And there are two forms of, of tariffs. Actually, this would apply to all the different kinds of tariffs, not just the import tariff. But uh, we can formulate tariffs on the basis of a specific duty, which is a by unit value, or an ad valorem duty, which is by the total value. Uh, so a specific duty means, let's say you're importing automobiles into the United States. Every car has a let's say a $100 tariff, $100 per unit. If it's a car, the tariff is $100. Ad valorem duty says, uh, well, there's a big difference between um, a Toyota Camry and a high-end BMW. Um, and any uh, lower value car coming in will be charged a percentage of the value, which will result in a lower tariff than a high value car that will have also the same percentage but that will result in a larger absolute tariff. So ad valorem duty is by on a, as a percentage of the value, specific duty is per unit of that product. Okay, so tariffs are commonly used as trade barriers and they have, uh, the use of tariffs has declined, they're the size, average size of tariffs have declined uh, over the last several decades. Um, in fact, Average tariffs are now down below 4% for most countries and most products. So, um, but there still exists a, a number of tariffs out there. Okay, other man-made barriers to trade would be in the category of non-tariff barriers. So anything that's not a tariff is a non-tariff barrier. There's a wider variety of these. We have quotas. Quotas are limits on the total value and or number of units of a particular good uh, that and it could apply to services as well you could have service quotas but particular good or service that is being imported and again I'm just making the assumption this all applies to imports uh, again you could have situations where there are export quotas but that would be very rare subsidies well subsidies are trade barriers in the sense that they distort pricing and um, 
create competitive advantages for the subsidized products over the foreign products that don't receive the subsidies, um, making it harder for the foreign products to be exported to that market where subsidies exist. It also could create an advantage for exports from those countries that provide subsidies uh, so that the, the prices of those subsidized products might be lower uh, as an export than they are uh, for the competing products in the domestic market. Um, so subsidies are primarily are used in the agricultural area, um, but uh, they can be used in a, in a lot of different ways as well. Uh, there are some that argue that in, in terms of aircraft production, commercial aircraft production, Airbus, for example, is a consortium of a number of different government-owned companies that um, Boeing argues are subsidized by their governments. Uh, Airbus argues that Boeing itself is subsidized, maybe not formally, but at least through defense contracts and other mechanisms that the U.S. government subsidizes Boeing's operations. So um, there are subsidies out there in a number of different industries. They are used and they do serve as a trade barrier. Another form of non-tariff barriers is in the realm of standards. This could be labeling requirements, testing requirements. Uh, an example is in Europe, uh, it, the uh, use of hormones in the production of uh, meat, for example, is um, not allowed. And so that eliminates much of the beef and poultry production in the United States that does use uh, those hormones. Now. Um, a case could be made that that's on the basis of um, health concerns, uh, but um, many in the United States would argue that, well, no, there's no demonstrated health consequence for that. Others would argue that, that yes, there is. So, so that one has some basis. There are other requirements, however, that are made particularly stringent just to serve as a barrier to trade. Uh, so the the degree to which certain requirements are logical and actually produce consumer health and safety is somewhat debatable. Sometimes um, those requirements are more trumped up and, and are really just a veiled barrier to trade. Another way to um, place limitations on trade without using tariffs and without using quotas and these other more obvious methods of, of trade barriers is the use of administrative delays. So let me give you an example. Uh, this is a classic example from back in the 1980s when VCRs were the hot product and Japan was dominant in the production of VCRs. Well, uh, French companies like Philips that were making VCRs were not happy about this competition from Japan and wanted protection from the French government. French government was unwilling to put tariffs or quotas on VCRs coming from Japan, but what they did was they uh, passed a rule that said that any VCRs coming into France had to enter through a single customs checkpoint and it was in a very inconvenient location up on the border with the Swiss Alps and might have been the Italian Alps, I don't know, it was a remote location and um, it was poorly staffed so you had lines of trucks there waiting to bring VCRs into the country that were not allowed to come in because, of course, um, uh, things took a long time to process. Now, that provided a delay which allowed the French government to negotiate with the Japanese, and it ended up in some voluntary restraint agreements, which is just another form of a quota, but it's a voluntarily imposed quota um, that provided further protection. But administrative delays can be used in that way. Um, Another clever non-tariff barrier related to administrative delays but actually incurring some actual costs is in Peru. Uh, the Peruvian government instituted a rule that um, all imported goods needed to be stored in government-owned storage facilities for a period of time before they could be released to the, uh, the market in Peru. Well, this did two things. One, it provided delay and uh, also limited, actually did three things, provided delay, limited the amount of imports to the amount of storage capacity available, and third, incurred those fees which served essentially as a tariff. So uh, officially this was not a tariff or a quota, but it had a severe limiting effect on exports, or I'm sorry, imports coming in to Peru. Um, 
There are a bunch of other measures that can be used as tariff barriers that, I mean, as sorry, trade barriers that are not tariffs. Uh, most of these have to do with currency rules and the ability to obtain foreign currency. Remember that any time you have a, an international trade transaction, there's a corresponding, well, almost any time, there's a corresponding currency trade to back that up. If currency is not tradable or there are limitations on the use of currency, then that might serve as a barrier to the trade that is, that is occurring. So counter trade, licensing arrangements, and foreign exchange controls are all placed as mechanisms to limit the amount of uh, imports coming into a country. Uh, and, and in many, most of those cases, it's, it's also to help preserve the value of the currency and not have it uh, devalued through a, an excessive amount of imports coming in all at once. All right, continue on with some more man-made barriers to trade in the realm of services. So services are becoming a larger and larger part of the economy, and therefore trade in services has also been growing. In fact, they account for about 30% of international trade. Uh, transportation is a service, and that's one area in which uh, there are a lot of restrictions uh, regarding international uh, providers. Um, in the United States, for example, foreign ships are not allowed to carry cargo between domestic ports in the U.S. Airlines are not allowed to, foreign airlines are not allowed to transport passengers from one airport in the United States to another airport in the United States. So, uh, and, and those rules are not un, uh, unique to the United States. We see that in a lot of other countries as well. Uh, you can see other interesting service trade barriers there like uh, Germany requiring the use of German models and advertisements and Japan limiting the amount of participation in the insurance industry by foreign firms. All of these are examples of limitations on the trade of services. So all governments are confronted with this basic dilemma. They must decide whether these trade barriers that exist should be dismantled or whether they should be maintained or perhaps new barriers should be created or the existing barriers should be strengthened, I guess is another option. Um, so this is a constant source of debate within governments, which trade barriers should be included, which should be reversed, um, how, you know, how about the general level of trade barriers, which industries should be protected, which industries should not be. So we're now shifting our discussion into this political realm and we're going to look at the underlying political realities that are driving this situation and particularly we'll look at one specific example within the United States of how this process works. So um, really at the heart of the matter, protectionism is a structural problem and here is the issue. Barriers to trade do in fact increase costs. So they, they eliminate those uh, gains from trade that we saw in the previous example and uh, therefore increase costs and so they, they might um, fully eliminate the gains from trade and prevent that from happening at all. Um, so these increased costs are a potential problem but they are generally shared very widely and therefore perceived as small. Again we'll get to a specific example in a minute where you'll see clearly how this happens but increased costs from barriers to trade are shared widely and perceived as small. Now on the other side of it, every barrier to trade will also create benefits for other parties. So barriers to trade increase costs for some, but create benefits for others. Those benefits are always isolated to a few people or organizations or companies or industries. Those benefits, however, when concentrated in those few companies or industries or individuals can be very large, very significant. So you have this notion of a, the cost being small but the benefits being large. Okay, Even though it's really just because of the way that those costs and benefits are spread, uh, that they are quite diluted, that the costs are diluted and the benefits are concentrated. That's the heart of the problem. Well, that leads us to a poem by Ogden Nash, which is a broader political problem. It has to do with taxation as well as trade barriers, but it applies very well to the trade barriers. He says, Behold the politician, self-preservation is his ambition. He has many profitable hobbies, 
not the least of which is lobbies. He gains votes ever and anew by taking money from everybody and giving it to a few. So good insight there from Ogden Nash that um, holds in the case of trade. Well, let's look at this example then. In the United States, we have a sugar tariff quota. This was actually introduced way back in the 1920s initially, strengthened during the heart of the Depression in 1934, designed to protect sugar farmers, primarily sugar beet farmers in the West and Midwest, but also sugar cane farmers along the Gulf states. Well, let's look at and see how this operates. Uh, the U.S. actually, had, there's several dimensions to this. There is a tariff, there is also a quota. Here is the 2015 allocation by metric tons for the amount of sugar that can be imported to the United States. The United States does produce sugar, but not enough to meet the demand of, um, of all the people in the United States, and that demand is quite significant, again, as we'll see here in just a minute. So um, we have to import sugar from other countries. The, the government limits it to these amounts by country. And in addition, charges a tariff. Well, <clears throat> and they do a few other things too, but those are the two primary mechanisms in this policy. So what happens then? Well, let's look at the result. There are costs to this policy. The costs are in higher costs to US consumers for sugar. The world average for raw sugar is 17 cents a pound in April 2014. Um, that in the United States was 24.3 cents per pound. That's a 43% difference. Refined sugar, 21.4 cents in the world, 29.8 cents in the United States, 39% higher. Well, And if you look at the absolute difference there, 7.3 cents on raw sugar per pound and 8.4 cents per pound on refined sugar. All right, that's a cost. Well, what does that mean for the average consumer? The impact on consumers, uh, well, it's a mixed bag. First of all, we have to recognize that, as I just pointed out, the price of sugar in the United States because of these policies is 8.4 cents a pound higher than the world price. Well, now we have to ask, how much do, uh, sugar does the average U.S. citizen consume? And that is a surprising number. The U.S. consumes 24 billion pounds of refined sugar per, per year, which works out to over 75 pounds per person. So I don't know if each of you consumes 75 pounds of sugar or not, um, but the average American does and I might have been in that category at some point. I'm trying to get out of that category or get under the average instead of being at the average or even above it. Um, doesn't sound very healthy, but that's how much sugar we consume in all of our food products and everything. That's the total amount of sugar produced and imported into the United States, 24 billion pounds, divided by the total number of people in the United States, about 318 million as of now which leaves us with 75.2 pounds per person. Well, what's the ep economic impact then? It's just 75.2 pounds times 8.4 cents, which means that collectively in the U.S., it costs us over $2 billion per year because of these sugar tariffs and quotas. $2 billion collectively. But how? It, what is that per person? The, the average per person is $6.32. So it costs me personally $6.32, assuming I'm an average consumer of sugar, because of these sugar tariffs and quotas that are in place and enforced by the U.S. government. All right, well, interesting, but not earth-shattering. I mean, can I manage that $6.32 cost? Yes. Uh, that is, even if I were a minimum wage worker, that's less than an hour of labor per year to cover that cost, most people don't get too upset about it. We don't think of it as, as a really big deal that we want to spend a lot of time fighting against. Now let's look at it on the other side. What's the impact on producers? Well, there are 666 sugarcane farms in the United States and an additional 3,913 sugar beet farms in the U.S. This is 2014 data. Um, 
These sugar farms produce 1.3% of the total agricultural value that's produced in the United States, but they spend heavily on lobbying. And they, sugar farms account for 31% of all agricultural lobbying expenditures, far, out, uh, far outsized from the amount of production. All right, well, what did they get in terms of return on that investment? Uh, the total investment is $9.6 million for the sugar industry. And how much is the tariff and quota worth to them? Well, we said it's oh, the benefit, the cost for consumers is over $2 billion, but we have to translate that into a direct benefit for the sugar producers. They benefit by over $2 billion, divided by the 4,779 sugar farms in the United States we find that the tariff and quota system in place is worth f about $440,000 per farm. Well, since they spent $9.6 divided by the number of farms, the average lobbying cost is $2,096 per farm. So that's a heck of an investment. By spending $2,096 per farm, they're able to get a return of four hundred and forty thousand dollars by having that tariff in place that means that the ROI per farm is twenty thousand eight hundred and ninety two percent an astounding return no wonder um, they're interested in preserving this tariff it's extremely valuable to them and the cost to maintain it is quite cheap two thousand dollars per farm now if for some reason more attention came to this issue and there was uh, another body that was lobbying against this, the question would be how much would the sugar industry be prepared to pay to lobby to preserve this tariff? And assuming economic rationality, the answer to that question would be at least $440,000 per farm. If they lose the tariff, they go out of business entirely. So, in fact, they would spend even more than $440,000 per farm. They would spend up to the amount of their total profits. And if they felt that there was a short-term loss that would be incurred for a longer-term gain, they would go even farther than that and actually spend more than their profits. So um, it's, it's a formidable problem here to, to overturn the sugar tariff would take quite a significant effort in a, um, in a, a resistance campaign or a, a lobbying campaign from the other side. Well, I have a proposal here. The proposal is that we all band together as consumers and if each of us spends only six cents per year in a lobbying fund to try to abolish the, amount, the sugar tariff and quota, we would spend twice as much as the entire sugar industry. Right, that would be about $20 million, six cents per person. So for my family of six, I would spend 36 cents to try to overturn this sugar tariff. All right, that seems pretty reasonable. What would our return be on that doubling of lobbying to overturn this tariff? Well, remember, that it costs each of us $6.32 per year to maintain this tariff. So our six cent investment per person would yield a $6.32 per year return. So in terms of ROI, that's 10,433%. That's a pretty good investment. It doesn't compare, however, to the sugar industry's investment. They're getting a higher return than that on their lobbying efforts. So clearly there's an asymmetry here that those whose interests are opposed to the tariff or should be opposed to the tariff don't really care. Those who inter whose interests are in favor of the tariff care a heck of a lot and are willing to spend heavily to preserve it and get a huge return for those efforts. Creates a conundrum um, and that's the case with most trade barriers. Those who are protected by them will fight tooth and nail to preserve them those that are hurt by them generally don't care as much and will give up. The cost of the taxpayers of this whole sugar barrier, um, well, in 2013, in just a single month, 
the U.S. government lost over $53 million by buying beet sugar from domestic producers to sell to ethanol producers. Now, that's not necessarily directly related to the tariff, but it's another example of government getting involved in these kinds of things and messing some things up at a cost to taxpayers. Um, and then uh, NAFTA presents an interesting dimension. We're going to talk more about NAFTA here in just a minute. But because of NAFTA, there are no tariffs or quotas for sugar coming from Mexico. And Mexico is a pretty significant sugar producer. Um, well, what that has done is it has driven down the price of sugar in the U.S. And in fact, U.S. sugar producers have gotten mad at that and have accused Mexico of dumping um, which is where you sell your product in another country for below the cost of production. Well, um, they don't have much of a case there because Mexico is actually selling their sugar at above world prices, not below world prices. So to say that they're selling it at a cost below the cost of production would be inaccurate. Um, sugar producers are not likely to win that argument, but they are working hard to gain protection from Mexican sugar producers. All right, um, well, what are the justifications for these protectionist policies? We've, we've seen some in these examples, but um, let's, let's clarify a little bit what, what those lobbyists might use as an argument as they go into legislators to try to um, convince them to either increase tariffs or, or introduce new tariffs or to maintain tariffs that exist. What are they going to be arguing for? Well, number one, they're always, oh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> the most effective argument they might use, and the one that is most receptive among lawmakers, is to reciprocate against unfair trade. So this allegation of dumping is kind of in that line. Dumping is an unfair trading practice. If one country is proven to be dumping against another country, well, this is a big problem. In fact, this is a problem within the WTO and there are real penalties that the WTO can enforce here. But, um, but in this particular case, um, uh, you know, that, that's not real in the sugar case. Um, it's, it's, it's not real. But um, when there are unfair trade practices, such as dumping, or when another country imposes certain tariffs, and um, that could cause the, the other party to retaliate so that, and that's justifiable. One could argue that trade barriers used as a tool to fight against trade barriers is actually a good idea. Now that creates a trade war as both sides escalate the problem, but the incentives become smaller and smaller to escalate. In fact, um, using trade barriers as a mechanism to fight unfair trade generally is quite effective, and most of the time those unfair barriers are removed. So that's a good argument. Reciprocate against unfair trade things start to go downhill from here. Um, the most widely used argument is to protect employment. So all of these sugar farmers are going to claim that we have to save the jobs here. If we don't protect the sugar industry, we will lose all of those jobs. Well, there are a relatively small number of jobs that are protected by those subsidies. And I guarantee you, in fact, I did not do this calculation, but I would challenge you to do this. Look up how many workers there are in the US sugar industry. Divide $2 billion by that number of workers and see how much each job is worth in the sugar industry. Now, uh, then think about whether or not you should, uh, those workers are being paid what each job is worth. And I'm sure you will see that there's no way that they are. They're being, being, being paid very low wages. So the jobs that are being protected are few and are of low wage status, and the workers themselves are not reaping the benefits of this protectionism. It's the actual producers that are reaping the benefits. Um, so that argument doesn't usually hold up. It's been used in a lot of other industries, and the problem is that trade is completely objective. Trade doesn't care about who is hurt or what industries are hurt. It's not picking selected industries just because trade itself doesn't like those industries. It's because those industries are less efficient than other industries. And those jobs are creating less value relative to other jobs elsewhere. 
So when you lose jobs due to trade, it's actually and it results in an increase in efficiency in your overall economy. That's hard to tell somebody that has just lost their job because of foreign trade that, hey, you've just contributed to overall benefit within your country. You're, you're a true patriot. They don't feel that way. Nobody feels that way when jobs are lost due to foreign competition. Um, but the reality is that that's true. And there is also job creation that results because of trade. So we hardly ever hear about that. We don't hear about the jobs that are created because of trade. We only hear about the jobs that are lost. And so it's a very effective argument because it's a very emotional thing to lose your job. It does hurt people. It hurts them in real ways that are demonstrable and they can easily get upset about that and they can and that argument is usually uh, is listened to sympathetically. Um, another couple of uh, justifications are in the infant industry and senile industry side of things. So when an industry is just starting out within a country, an argument is usually made that it needs to be protected from foreign competition until it can become competitive, and then we, sh we can take away those protections. Uh, the problem with that argument is that if you protect an industry when it's young, it will be very difficult to ever take away those protections. And it will be very difficult for that industry to ever become globally competitive because it's going to be protected and therefore doesn't have the pressures to become globally competitive. On the other side of it, as you have a maturing industry that's going into decline, uh, there's going to be an argument made that, hey, it goes back to the employment thing as well. If we don't protect this industry, we're going to lose all these jobs. If we don't protect this industry, we're going to lose the whole industry. Well. There's a reason why that industry is in decline. Uh, there are underlying structural factors that, that make it so that industry is no longer as competitive in that particular country. And if you put protection on that, you're just going to introduce costs. And the end game is not going to change. Ultimately, that industry you might be able to string it on along for a little longer. Ultimately, it's not going to be able to survive. There's also an argument to use protectionism to protect critical industries. Um, so the automobile industry, the information technology industry, or the agricultural industry, in the case of our food supply, um, are often the targets of this argument. So we can't let foreign competition take over these industries because they're too important for our economy. Either they provide too many jobs, or they are tied into so many other parts of economic activity, or they are the, the future and we have to protect our future, um, or they... Uh, actually have a national security component uh, which is kind of the agricultural thing as well or maybe something like a steel industry that you know hey we, we will not survive if we don't have food and if we rely exclusively on imported food or he too heavily on imported food and what if countries say they don't like us anymore and they stop exporting their food to us we're going to all starve so we have to protect our domestic industry so that we produce our own food so that we won't starve if people don't ship it to us Right. Well, that's why in a country like Norway, food prices are astronomically high. Uh, there's no reason why they should have a widespread agricultural industry there. The climate's terrible. There's not as much arable land. But they maintain that industry on the basis of those national security arguments, and the consumers pay. They pay a premium for that. Now, sometimes that could be worth it. We might say, well, yes, it's worth it to us to keep these industries, and we're willing to pay more. Um, but sometimes those arguments are over, overblown as well. All right, uh, balance of payments improvements. So the, you know, going all the way back to mercantilism, countries love to have a trade surplus. They hate to have a trade deficit. So they might introduce certain elements of protectionism in order to limit the amount of imports coming on in and therefore improve their balance of payments, the difference between imports and exports. All right, well, how do we eliminate these barriers to trade? Once they're in place, how can they ever be eliminated? How can we um, try to improve the situation if there are these benefits to trade that we want to capture and we want to spur the growth and the gains from trade? How can we ever overcome these political problems and eliminate barriers to trade? Well, there are a number of mechanisms that have proven to be effective. First is multilateral negotiations. So this is where you get... Um, 
as many countries as possible, over 100 countries, 150, 180 countries involved, as many countries that want to come to the table, and you negotiate with all of those countries all at once on specific issues, and you come to broad-ranging agreements so that everybody all at once agrees to reduce barriers to trade. That way, everybody is hurt and helped all at the same time, and you can't say that one country gains an unfair advantage over another country. The most uh, active example of this multilateral process has been the GATT or the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade started way back in 1947. There have been a number of rounds of the GATT negotiations that have been quite successful. Um, as I said, average tariff rates have been reduced down to around 4% or less. Uh, that's from levels in 1947 that would have been much higher. Well, during the Depression, 1930s, they went way up, but um, uh, reasonable uh, in the in the 1940s and 50s, reasonable trade uh, tariff levels would have been around the 20% to 30% range. Those have come down significantly since that time. So the GATT process has been very successful at achieving a reduction in trade barriers. It's been so successful that it has culminated in the creation of the World Trade Organization, which has come directly out of that GATT process. The World Trade Organization has a number of universally agreed to rules and the ability to enforce breaches of those rules or enforce penalties on those who break those rules. So it's, it's been a very effective process and has resulted in much in terms of gains from trade. Currently there's a round of negotiations going on, it has been going on for a number of years, called the Doha Round. It's not been concluded successfully. The problem is that it's trying to address barriers in the agricultural area and that is one of the toughest places to uh, get concessions. So multilateral negotiations have been successful. There are also bilateral trade agreements and that's just when two countries negotiate a separate agreement with each other. Most typically this is a free trade agreement between two countries. They agree between those two countries to just go ahead and eliminate all barriers to trade all at once. I guess you know we could also add the category of unilateral trade agreements here because sometimes a country, and the United States has done this, decides that without negotiations it will just reduce barriers to trade without any other country requiring any other country to agree to the same thing under the idea that lower barriers to trade will result in gains. Now that's politically harder to pull off, uh, but there are examples of that. And another category of um, trade barrier elimination is regional negotiations. So there are also some good examples of this where countries within a particular region get together to reduce trade barriers in that region. The European Union is the best example of that. They've gone the farthest in cooperating to reduce trade barriers among European Union members. NAFTA is another example within uh, Mexico, Canada, and the United States that trade barriers have largely been eliminated. There's still a few that are out there. There are many, many other regional um, groupings, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or um, uh, there's CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement. Um, there are numerous uh, in each continent there are in each region of the world there are these regional entities that have been successful at reducing negotiate uh, reducing trade barriers within that particular region in terms of bilateral agreements the United States like I said is, has been active in that area in fact there are trade free trade agreements in effect with 20 countries right now between the United States and these countries uh, Canada Mexico and the United States that's North American Free Trade Agreement, but you can see that there are a lot of other countries, a lot in Central America, South America, that have uh, free trade agreements with the United States. Other interesting ones, like that should be South Korea, not North Korea. North Korea is not in that category. Um, South Korea, Israel, uh, some in the Middle East, Morocco in North Africa. Um, uh, what else? Well, Israel in the Middle East, Oman, um, there are Jordan. There are interesting uh, patterns of, of countries here that, that the United States has signed free trade agreements with. 
All right, uh, just a few words on regional economic integration. There are five steps to this process. The first is a free trade area. So this is where the countries within that region agree to eliminate all trade barriers among themselves. So they'll, they'll get rid of all tariffs. When we Generally, when we talk about trade barriers, we're talking about tariffs. Of course, trade barriers are a little bit broader than that, but I'm going to basically uh, focus on those. So you get rid of all of the tariffs within the area and, and eliminate those trade barriers. Well, the next step from a free trade area is called a customs union. When you have a free trade area, you eliminate internal tariffs, but each country maintains its own rate of external tariffs with other countries. And um, so in a customs union, there's a decision that's made to unify those external tariffs. So customs unions have unified external tariffs or a common external tariff. All the tariff schedules are the same for those countries that are participating in the customs union. And that's important because there, because of different external tariffs, there can be some trade diversion created. Trade patterns can favor those countries that have lower external tariffs than others within the region. And that provides the incentive to form a common external tariff and, and a associated customs union. The next stage of integration it's called a common market. Now, within a free trade area and a customs union, you allow the free movement of goods, and in some cases, services across borders. Primarily, we're talking about goods, though. Um, but you don't allow the movement of capital or the movement of labor. So in a common market, that is opened up so that not only do you have the free movement of goods, you also have the free movement of labor and capital. Uh, the, the European Union, before it was the European Union, was the European Common Market. Uh, they reached this, uh, this stage over 30 years ago. Uh, well, uh, there was a significant change in, in 1992, although that was really the, I guess, the birth of the European Union. So the Treaty of Rome, um, there were other treaties along the way that, that established a common market. So the common market in, in Europe you could probably trace back to somewhere in the 1970s or so. Um, so free movement of labor and capital as well as elimination of trade barriers within um, the region. All right, well, once you hit a common market, then there are pressures that build to try to unify in other directions as well, particularly in the economic arena uh, in terms of monetary and fiscal policies. So that's economic integration. So monetary policies have to do with interest rates, money supply, currencies, a common currency, for example, within Europe is part of economic integration in the European Union. Um, so there are pressures to, to have monetary policies that are uniform and fiscal policies that are uniform in terms of tax policies and um, government spending, all of those kinds of things, which impact the economy as well. Now in Europe there hasn't been as much integration along those lines as there has on the monetary side, but full economic integration would include a unified monetary and fiscal policy and leads then in a very short step from complete economic integration is complete political integration. Because once you start bringing fiscal policies into play, you really have to have political integration to pull that off. Uh, in the case of Europe, of course, they're not to that they're not politically integrated to a full extent. There have been some movements towards some levels of political integration, uh, but full political integration would be, in, in the case of Europe, for example, a United States of Europe, where the current countries of Europe would all band together to form a unified central government and a unified political entity called Europe or the European Union or whatever it might be called, the United States of Europe. They probably wouldn't like that name but it would essentially function that way and the current countries would become states under some federal structure. And so that's the, um, the essence of regional economic integration, uh, which is the, the final stage of, of or one of the possible ways in which um, trade barriers can be reduced and, and these political pressures to introduce and maintain and strengthen trade barriers can be reversed.